Okay. Let me get this thing on. You good? Testing, testing. Hello? 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 What's up? Hello? <laughs> Did I break it? <laughs> we good? You guys hear me? Yes. Can I get a head nod? Yes. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay. So as you're getting your Bibles out. Hello, I'm Donovan. If you didn't already hear that. I kind of volunteered to do this without fully grasping what it meant and the trial that is preparing a message. But big thanks to Uncle Dan and my uh, Serpa Jarmy. I got this done. It took me a while. I procrastinated a lot, but I know Warren can know that I was screaming in my room once I got this done because it was that exciting. But open up your Bibles to Philippians 2. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11. So, I'll just give you a second. Philippians 2 is an interesting book. It comes after the verse about living in a manner worthy of the gospel. And that's just, as, you're, as we read this, just keep that in mind. Are you living in a manner worthy? And in the, uh, verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, I have prayed so many times, Lord, you know my prayer. I pray for unity for this group. I pray that you would give me your spirit now and uh, open these people's ears and soften some hearts, Lord. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so who here has been to camp or summer camp? Oh, yeah. Okay, and if you didn't go, ask any of the people to raise their hand. They'll tell you it's the best time of year. Amen. But... There was a game a few years ago. There was a gigantic relay race around the entire campground. And what we had to do on the last leg of the race was a pyramid crawl. Does anyone remember that? That was kind of crazy. We saw it a couple weeks ago here at Crossroads, but it's basically like stacking cups. There's three at the bottom, two in the middle, and one on the top. And the people at the bottom have to crawl across the field. But imagine with me if one of those people at the bottom decided that it was enough that they didn't want to bear the load anymore. They're like, ah, I don't care. Or imagine if the person that was supposed to go on top was like, nah, not for me. What would happen? Any thoughts? On some hands, people. What would happen? It wouldn't be a pyramid. When? You would fall. You would fall? That would, yeah, if the person at the bottom, you'd all be tumbling down, Warren. You'd lose. You'd lose, thank you. So, if, <laughs> well, okay, you're assuming that you're losing, but if you got back up, but you would lose, right? If somebody on the team said it was enough, you're not making any progress. You, if somebody was like, I don't want to do this, you're going to be stagnant in the race. But what if we all wanted to win the race, like you should in a team, but what would happen? Shout it out if you have to. What's happening if we all have the same mindset of winning the race? Win. You're gonna win. Is that right or wrong? You're gonna win. If you all want to win, you're gonna win. So if 
the other one, where, where, where am I? The okay, so you can easily come together and win that race. And we see that very instruction, that very thought of being in the same mindset in Paul's letter to the Philippians. We see Paul telling everyone at the church in Philippi to find their joy in Christ. To rejoice in what Christ has done and what we find in him. Our grace and peace, our delight, our union under one church body. But while Paul is writing this letter, he's actually in prison, if you didn't know. He's in a Roman guard prison. So this is like the big leagues of prison. It's not no like county jail where you get bailed. You're in prison for life here. But well, uh, while Paul is here, he is in Roman prison where he's preaching to everyone he has contact with. So imagine you're in prison and you're in your cell. But not only was he in a cell, he was in his cell and he was chained to a guard. That's very close personal space. You're chained to a guard. And what did Paul do? He's here preaching the gospel to this guy. And this is a Roman Praetorian guard. This is like the Green Berets or the Marines of the time. These are scary, buff, big guys. <laughs> like, imagine one of these guys over here. I, you, you see them. They're big and scary. Imagine that guy. You're chained to him in a prison. This is just not a good, not a good thing. But Paul's here preaching the gospel. And, uh, but, okay, so Paul and the Philippians have an interesting relationship. So Paul loves this church, but at one point, he was imprisoned and beaten at Philippi by the people that he loves and the people that he's writing this letter to. But, and this, the same thing that happened in Roman prison, he's there, and he's preaching gospel, he's singing songs to Christ. He's preaching gospel like he always does. And that, the message of the gospel had spread throughout all of Philippi. And the Philippians believed, and Paul had planted a church there. But then, here we have Paul in the Roman prison. He is chained to a guy. Also, uh, and then we have the Philippians. He, they send a gift by way of a messenger, a man named Epaphroditus, who got, went from the Philippians to the Roman. The Roman prison. There you go. That's a word. Sorry. <laughs> and he, we have this man, Epaphroditus, but as, as he gets to Rome, he becomes Ill, sick. He's ill. And the Philippians are worried about him. And this uh, letter to the Philippians is his response. And then, as I said before, chapter 2 comes uh, after the famous verse about conduct yourself man and worthy of the gospel. That's chapter 1, verse 27. So we have this idea of living the Christian life to the standard of the gospel. Like this is our rule set. And it should be for our day-to-day -day life, right? And in chapter 2, Paul makes it clear he's not done alone. The Christian life is one that's lived in community, is not an individualistic religion. Like in America, we value independence and self-reliance. Like the Lone Ranger type lifestyle. Where I don't want your help, I got it. But the Christian life is the life of many body parts working get together for the head, who is Christ Jesus. This is what we see in chapter 2. And my first point, well, first of all, let's get the title of the message, which is, that's not the title, something, whatever. First point, <laughs> my first point is, since you are united in Christ, live in unity. Verses 1 through 4. Since you are united in Christ, live in unity. Verse 1, it says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being made of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now, you see in verse 1, it says, if. But Paul isn't saying that there's not, because he's using this rhetorically. Excuse me. He says this rhetorically because we have encouragement, not if. There are no maybes about Christ. We know without a doubt we are complete in Christ. We do find encouragement. We have consolation. There is fellowship in the Spirit. And plenty of affection and compassion. All of these are derived from Christ. With that in mind, Paul wants this church in Philippi to be of the same mind. Meaning, that he wants them to be that winning team at summer camp. Everybody striving for the victory. 
with the same mind, being unified under the same love. And where does our love come from? It's Christ. It always will be and always has been. Okay. Okay, so if that's Paul's, if that's what Paul wants for this church in Philippi, do we see that here at Crossroads? Because, as I said before, the Bible is our standard of living. So what are we doing here at Crossroads? Are we living under the same love? Are we united in spirit? And that has been, that's Paul's uh, desire for this church. And that's my desire for you. That's just my desire for us. And so like, for example, like when we're in fellowship time, what are we doing? Are we actually fellowshipping or are we making jokes? It can be fun, but are we talking about the message? Are we encouraging our brothers and sisters? Things like that. That'd be great to see. Very encouraging even to the person who's doing it, doing it to, with, or and everyone around us, because we see that that one person, that becomes many. So are you are you attempting to be in fellowship? And it always starts with a try. I have talked to my disciple so many times about this. It's very uncomfortable at the beginning. But as you go, <laughs> amen. <laughs> but as you go on, you get better at it, like anything in the world. Like, who here thinks they were the best at volleyball when they first tried? Okay, no, they were jokingly hands, but nobody was good their seventh grade year. I, we don't expect you to be. But as you go on, you get better. The same thing applies to the gospel. As you practice it, as you're living in it, it becomes easier. So, uh, uh, kind of weird illustration, but it makes sense to me. So, imagine a cup, and as you're filling it up with water, what'll happen? It's gonna spill all over the place. But imagine if you are the cup, and the water is the gospel. You're gonna spill out the gospel with your friends and family. It's gonna be your, your lifeline. It'll be running through your veins. So as you're filling yourself with the gospel, you can fill other people's cup with the gospel. So, we have then in verses 3 and 4, we have, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. What we see here is Paul's desire for the, of unity for the Philippians and what it looks like. Paul wants them to be there for each other, to be selfless, and to think of others as more important than yourselves. And we all know that we think of ourselves highly. Like Some people a little too much. I'm at fault there too because what do we do? We wake up in the morning, we feed ourselves, and we sleep. That's taking care of yourselves. We regard ourselves highly. So what if you were to put other people's interests before your own? And uh, we kind of see the same thing uh, over in Galatians 6, which says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in trespass, well, for example, if somebody was in sin and you see it, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Yeah. So go out of your way to help a struggling brother or sister. If you see somebody that's maybe not even reading their Bible or is in sin, go to them. But do it in a spirit of, do it in a gentle way with kindness and humility. Even if they're struggling, don't treat other Christians like they are lesser because we are all saved by grace. We are sinners saved by grace. Go to them without accusation and always pointing them back to the Christ, the one in whom we find all encouragement and compassion we can ever need. Okay, and for my second point, moving right along here. Second point, since you are to imitate Christ, follow his example of humility and unity. Since you are to imitate Christ, follow his example of humility and unity. Verses five through eight, starting in verse five. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now we see that is a direct command to all Christians. To have the attitude of Christ. Now do you have that attitude? Are you, and what, is that, what does that attitude look like? The attitude of Christ was one of a servant, and he had taken the largest burdens. Christ, the Lord of all, 
came for you and me. He came for us. He was looking out for our interests and not because he would be glorified, even though he is and he does deserve it. In verse 6, who although he existed, Jesus, existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ, while he was on earth, he was born, he was here. You know that for a fact, it says in the Bible. He existed as the God-man, meaning he was fully man and fully God. But while he lived on earth, he did not take on his divine rights, all of the glory that comes with being God, the creator of the universe. He didn't expect people to treat him like God. No, it says, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Or in other words, even though he was actually God in the flesh, he didn't think of equality with God as something that he wanted. He would cling, it's something that he would cling to or rely on. Instead, Jesus gave up his divine privilege. The Son of God, he emptied himself, veiling all his glory. Instead, taking on all of his divine right, instead of take, instead, sorry, instead of taking on all of his divine rights, he lived as a man. Not only this, but he lived as a man, and he died for us. He took on the title of servant, and eventually took on the title of criminal while hanging on the cross. So, if the holy Lord of the universe displayed this level of humility, how can we as sinful creatures deserving of hell do any less? If possible, we should do even more. This is painting a picture of someone giving up their title. Imagine like a king getting rid of his crown, taking off his robes, taking, stepping down from the throne, and joining the servants to serve the next king. Or imagine the president taking off the suit, going into the White House and cleaning the bathrooms. He's over here, mop on the ground, <laughs> when he should be leading our country. That's the idea of Christ. And uh, in verse 7 it says, bond servant, which in, it, in the original text it, it said, doulos, which literally translates to slave. See, a servant usually gets paid and then gets to go home. Their master would give them a, a house to live in and uh, currency to spend with. But a slave is owned. A slave is obedient to the point of death on a cross. Are you willing to do this for others? Christ, the highest of all, the creator and rightful ruler of earth and everyone in it, humbling himself as a slave. Dying the death we should die and being highly exalted. So, are you willing to be there for your brothers and sisters? Just look around you. Are you willing to be there? To your friends? To your loved ones? To be there as a slave. Now, I'm not saying, and get this one clear, that I'm not saying that you could go die on the cross for your, for your friends and family. That, that's not going to help them. If you get that in your mind, come talk to me after. <laughs> so you're not dying on the cross for them, but you should uh, extend this type of humility to your friends, to your family, to your loved ones, to anybody that you care about, even people that you may not care about. They need to hear this message that we have. So extend this level of humility to your friends. <laughs> so, are you willing to be, uh, to be there for your brothers and sisters? So prefer, prefer others. Do simple things. Like, get the water for your friends. Get the trash up for your, for your parents. Do simple things. Or even lending a, a pen for notes. Like some of you probably did. So, or even as big as coming alongside your brother and sisters and encourage them, even one thing that you read in the morning or one thing that you heard from a message the past day. Christians are not meant to be alone in our walk. And sometimes it seems like we're all kind of lonely. It's hard to be excited and on fire for Christ if nobody else is doing it. So be the change. You have to be the one that becomes the many. And together, as sons and daughters of Christ, we can be the, this one body that I keep talking about. Also, don't be the guy or girl who is sad or mopes around, not, acts like nobody loves them. Because we do. We love you dearly. Uh, don't, don't be waiting for someone to pay attention to them. And 
And all in all, this is a form of pride. Self, self-loathing has always been a form of pride. Also, on the flip side, don't be an enabler of a closed-off group, also known as a clique. I know we kind of joke around about it, but don't enable closed-off groups. We all should be loving towards one another. We should all be inviting towards one another. And on the very opposite side of this, a Christ-like person focuses on other people, not yourself. You, they, they would go to other people and look to see about meeting their spiritual and physical needs. So do this. Make sure that you're going out and helping each other. And so for my third point, okay, so third point. Since every knee will bow to Christ in unity or enmity, surrender to him. Verses 9 to 13. In the next verses, we see the reason why Christ has done this. Why he has emptied himself and taken on, taken on the form of a slave for us. Verse 10 says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Stop there. We are talking about Christ's second coming. He came as a man, uh, he came as a man and died, rose from the dead, and exalted to the right hand of God. But this, this is going to be sometime in the future. I won't get much into it, but this is not a good time for unbelievers. Christ has come again as a judge for your sins that you have committed. Just like Andrew was talking about. He's either going to be your savior or your judge. And it says in the, in the text, it says, every knee will bow and you will bow. This verse uses every, not some, not a few, not people that are in this room, not people that go to your school. It says every single person in this world created past, present, and future. Okay, and okay, and what is the symbol of bowing? Bowing has always been out of respect. What are you bow to? You're bowing to uh, rulers, your elders, people of power, and people that have power over you. And how much more power does the Lord of all and righteous judge have over us? Verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So that all these, that every also includes people that are saved, heaven, and those who are judged under the earth or hell. Every human being, alive or dead, every angelic creature, every demon, even Satan himself, will bow to Jesus Christ. And in Romans 14, 11, it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will praise God. So you're confessing that Jesus is Lord. And even if you don't want to, you're going to praise God because he's so glorious. And back in, verse, or back in Philippians, it says, in verse 11, it says, And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no doubt, we see here, that everyone, no matter what you believe, what country you're from, whether you say you're an atheist or religious, wherever you are at, everybody will say that Christ, the servant God-man, is Lord of all. And to focus in on the word confess, which means you have guilt when you confess something, like if you're confess, confessing up to a uh, law that you broke, you have guilt. You know that you've done wrong. But at that point, it'll be too late. At the point of Christ's second coming, it's too late for the unbeliever. But there is hope. So since every knee will bow, you should bow to Christ as your Savior now. Because if you wait too long and keep rejecting him, Later, you will be forced to bow, him, to bow to him as your judge. You're going to bow now, or you're going to bow later. Do it now while you can be on good terms with God. And tonight, I want to extend the opportunity to bow to Christ. Even if, if, even if it's your first time here, first time hearing this message, or have heard it a million times. Bow to him in order to be unified with true fellowship. So, we have our command to be unified. And we have our example to follow, which is Christ, and the reason Christ came. But how can you have access to this union under Christ and avoid our deserved judgment and punishment? Let's turn to Romans 10, verse 9. A couple books back. Shouldn't be too hard to find. It says, 
starting in verse 9. But if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on, uh, call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 9, we have the word confess. But here it's kind of used like you say it. That you say verbally or in your head if, you, if you're praying. You say, Jesus is my Lord. He rules my life. I no longer am the ruler of my life. And I want Jesus as my ruler. It says, if you claim Christ as your Lord and repent of your sins, you will be saved. You will be saved. There's no doubt. The punishment that I was talking about, you avoid that because Christ paid it for you. You will be saved from sin, saved from hell, and taken into the church of Christ despite your past sin, despite your race, despite anything. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, meaning there is no more division between us. It doesn't matter where you come from or what you look like. We are one under Christ. And the death that he died, we are in union. So, be in union, bear the burdens of others, follow Christ's example, bow the knee in union. Back in Philippians 2, look back, verses 12 to 13, or 12 and 13, yeah. And it says, I'm going to end with this. So, so then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work with you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It says, just as you always obeyed, Paul is writing to the Philippians again, and he was there for a time, but now he is absent, he is in jail. And he's, the, his prayer is still the same. He says, now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So even in the absence of oversight, like here at Crossroads or in church, even without out the absent, absence of oversight, even without constant reminders, even without your parents, even without other Christians around, do these things. Make sure you're loving towards others. You are following Christ, Christ's example, and you are working out your salvation. God is working in you for your sanctification. God works through us to help others. So until we see Christ, be unified. So imagine again, you are a camp, and you're the walking pyramid. Are we going to be the one that wins? Or are we going to be the one that falters and loses? Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray this prayer many times, Lord. I pray for unification under one church body, under Christ as the head. I pray for these people now. I pray that you have touched lives here tonight, Lord. I pray that uh, you get the glory tonight. I also thank you, Lord, for enabling me to bring this message. In your name, amen. amen. amen.